welcome. My name is Sultan Rana, and joining me is my co-lead, Saima Choudhury, and we are the co-chairs for the York University Faculty of Education Summer Institute. Thank you so much for joining us in this year's conference, FESI 2022, Collective Dreaming, Co-Constructing Conditions for Liberatory Education. We would like to start off our conference and keynotes today in a good way and acknowledge our land through the land acknowledgement. York University recognizes that many Indigenous nations with, have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The university acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tukuranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now the home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dishes One Spoon, One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As we read the land acknowledgement today, I think about a provocation that I offer my students at the start of classes. I often ask them why we do a land acknowledgement and what the purpose is behind a land acknowledgement. And in the same spirit, I ask you to think about the same provocation. After some pause for thought, we share our ideas. To be honest, not too many ideas are offered. I think this may be because some folks have not really thought about the meaning behind the land acknowledgement because it's rarely modeled for us to really pause to think about it um, in our institutions, in events, or in our schools. But it also may be because some are worried about giving the quote unquote right answer, which is a clear testament to the colonization of schooling, where we're taught that the only right answer is that that's already predetermined by the educator or the person who holds power within the space, rather than authentic sharing of thoughts and ideas based in experiences. But some of the ideas that are shared are things like to remember our history. To which I say, okay, so um, maybe let's extend beyond that to think about uh, the truths of our histories on this land, the implications of these stories on our present, and what this means for our futures. Um, some people will say things like, to think of the land, to which I say, and specifically, what about the land? Uh, perhaps our lack of relationship to the land, um, how we came to be upon this land, how we've commodified the land, how we don't think of land as relations, um, you know, all that kind of takes a little bit of unpacking throughout we, as we move throughout the semester but I like to plant them as seeds for provocations. Um, and then another common, co common comment that I get is to honor indigenous people. Um, this is one that I get quite frequently. Um, and this one I like to pause and really think about um, with my students. Um, and I like to really think about what does that really mean? Um, I like to push the learning here. Um, and I like to ask, how does a scripted land acknowledgement, quote unquote, honor Indigenous people? Does it change your state of mind? Does it impact the way that you think? Uh, does it prompt you to re-examine your relationships? Does it perhaps encourage you to learn more about the truths of the stories in this land that you need to actively go out and seek? Does it change your actions and how you live and engage um, with, your really, uh, with all your relations on the land? Does it encourage you to think differently about your consumption patterns? Um, and does it encourage you to learn about your responsibilities as a treaty person? Um, while I throw out these provocations, I know full well that for me, um, as I think is the case for many, um, I'm so very aware of my own limitations um, when it comes to this with, when it comes to this knowledge. And I'm only emergent in these areas of learning myself. It makes, my, makes me unsettled and it creates unsettled feelings within my students as well. Um, but I feel that the way that I have approached those unsettled feelings is to, is to be completely truthful and honest um, about my own learning, um, about how my past socialization and learning and understandings require a lot of unlearning and unpacking. Um, and I like to share with my students where I am in that journey of learning and some of the sources that I'm turning to in those moments um, to really help me to unpack 
the journey that I'm on and to address those feelings of kind of being unsettled um, because I understand that that is me pushing my own learning edge. So in the spirit of the theme of this conference and this coming together of learning to do differently and the pushing of each other to do things in a better way, um, we are going to share with you some kind of uh, some jumping points of learning um, that have been jumping points for us. Um, fully recognizing that you may be on your own journey and you may have your own provocations and you may have your own spaces that have prompted you into your own learning. And that's wonderful. And that's why we come together so that we can share and do better together. Um, and um, so, but we're going to share with you what we're what we're kind of um, at in our learning journey and provide those links to you today, because maybe they'll serve as a jumping point for you um, or, and, or maybe a provocation for you, or maybe something that you want to add to your own personal learning journey as we think about the land acknowledgement and learning to do better. Um, so a few years ago, I read uh, an article, uh, two articles. Um, one was called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor uh, by Tuck and Yang. And the second one was uh, Decolonizing Anti-Racism uh, by Lawrence and Doa. Um, we're just going to show, uh, share a little bit of a snippet with you from both of them. The lack of centering land sovereignty and anti-racist discourses speaks to a reluctance on the part of non-natives of any background to acknowledge that there is more to this land than being settlers on it, that there are deeper, older stories and knowledge connected to the landscapes around us. And that's coming from decolonizing anti-racism and from decolonization is not a metaphor by Eve Tuck and K. Wayne Yang, describing all struggles against imperialism as decolonizing creates a convenient ambiguity between decolonization and social justice work, especially among people of color, queer people, and other groups minoritized by the settler nation state. So someone who's been committed to anti-oppressive education as a learner and educator, I've never really felt called out the, what I, the way that I was called out by these two articles. Um, they both really gave me pause to rethink and change my actions and really made me question how it is that I engage in my work. Um, and I had awarenesses that I was contributing towards erasure. Um, and, you know, in my efforts to include Indigenous perspectives, Indigenous voices, Indigenous communities, I perhaps wasn't doing it the way that I really should be doing it. So um, that really launched me into kind of relearning um, some growth, really some personal exploration, uh, sourcing of sources, sourcing of sources um, on how I could do better. Um, and it just so happened that um, last year I was in an Indigenous leadership course with uh, Dr. Uh, Ruth Colzar Green, and um, I was sharing with her this you know, learning journey that I'm on. And she said to me, um, have you read my article? What is a guest and what is a settler? And I said, no, I actually haven't. And so she shared her article with me. And again, we're going to share it with you below uh, for your own personal reading. Um, but it was just as if the universe kind of just fell into place. The article not only spoke directly in response to those two articles, that we just kind of give you a snippet from, but they also offered kind of a concrete framing for the work that I was currently engaged in. Um, and so we're just gonna read from you a little bit of a snippet from, um, from Ruth's article. So uh, from, just, yep, sorry. So we're just gonna share with you a little bit of a snippet from Ruth's article. Uh, I'll just let you know ahead of time, she uses a Mohawk word, um, Okinawan, which means First Nations or First Peoples upon the land. Uh, so when you hear that, the, um, that term, that's what it's referring to. Sultan? Yeah, so what is a guest? What is a settler? A guest is an individual that is in relationship to the land in a way that supports stewardship and not ownership. A guest is an individual who is in relationship with Okinawi, communities and who respects reciprocal engagement. The rights that go along with being a guest are to be on the territory and the responsibilities of being a guest are to support Okinawa nations by centering and supporting the traditional free contact and contemporary post-contact treaties. There is a responsibility to know the colonial stories and to support the resistance under the leadership of Okinawa people to continuing to continuing colonial projects in acknowledging the land guests need to be more than guests need to do more than offer words they need to offer actions that support the sovereign nations 
whose territories they are guests on. Finally, a guest is someone who is traveling down the river of life in their own vessel. At the same time, a guest actively engages on Kanawe people with the reciprocal process of peace, friendship, and mutual respect. Thank you. So th this article really, for me, made uh, made it very concrete about some of my responsibilities as a settler or a guest on the land. Um, and really based in this framing, we just offer you this collection of points of exploration for your own consideration on aspects of truth that may set us further along the journey of reconciliation. Um, again, I'm just sharing some of the personal ones uh, that we're working on. And of course, everyone is on their own journey. Um, but be sure to, as a potential jumping board, if you're looking for um, starting points for your own learning journeys. And um, I hope that we can come together in this way and share authentically about where we are and be vulnerable to share, you know, that yes, we do have learning edges, but by acknowledging our learning edges and being honest about it and in coming together to share, that's how we authentically can do better together as communities. Uh, for me personally, if I find I've kind of switched the way that I think now, uh, while I was unsettled by that kind of discomfort I felt about not really having answers and not knowing where to go and being kind of unsteady on my feet um, when it came to learning, um, particularly in terms of truth matters um, in pertaining to our true histories on this land. Um, and I, um, I, I've now switched my lens where if I'm not unsettled, and I'm, if I'm feeling comfortable, um, then I know that I'm actually not in a state of learning anymore. And so I act actively seek that out. If I feel like I'm comfortable, I now actively seek um, new learning. Um, and I ask people, hey, can you, this is how I'm, where am I? I am, I am right now. This is where my journey is. Uh, do you have any suggestions for me? Um, because it's really important that we hold each other accountable as a collective. And for the people that I have the privilege of working with now, and for those of you who I hope I have the privilege with working with in the future, I really hope that we, um, you hold me accountable um, because it's only through this collective sense of accountability, this collective sense of responsibility to do better and to honor relations that we can do um, better for all of us together. Thanks, Simon. So for Simon and I, this is our last year as co-chairs of FESI. Uh, we will continue to be a part of the bigger, uh, the larger FESI advisory, but we both exit our secondments this year. And we hope that the co-learning we've been able to offer over the past three years, can't believe it's been for three years, uh, have been as rich for you as it has been for us. So uh, under the leadership of Vidya Shah, Carl James, Dr. Carl James, and Jack Negro, um, let me just, I'm going to refix that. Under the leadership of Dr. Vidya Shah, Dr. Carl James, and Jack Negro, we have been as much learners in this space as we have um, been at the helm of it. FESI offers a very unique space, space of learning to really push boundaries of learning and to take time to pause, to re-examine our relationships, and to think, uh, you know, in a way in which we can be together differently. Uh, it offers the opportunity to authentically marinate uh, with community, families, scholars, students, and leaders all together, you know, in, in no kind of uh, uh, siloed spaces. In this space, we come together as a community to think of collective ways to do education differently and hopefully better. We found it fortuitous and so very fitting that the latest publication of Rethinking Schools, Teaching for Joy, opened with the following. The world is broken, but instead of giving up, instead of resigning, teachers need to pivot to make teaching an act of defiance, a declaration that, only, that the only way forward is through lessons that teach students to remember joy, to activate their muscles of imagination, kindness, laughter, playfulness, and solidarity. This speaks beautifully to this year's conference theme. No single person holds the answers to the challenges we face. Many of us are busy doing that we have forgotten what it feels like to dream and to feel joy. In coming together, those of us in schools, those in the classroom, in administration, families, and in communities, we can co-create those spaces that hold multiple truths and dream together. So without further ado, 
We welcome you to the exceptional learning that we hope will really change and push your learning for liberatory learning. Welcome to FESI 2022. Robert Savage, the Dean of the Faculty of Education at York University, and it's my great honour to welcome you to the 2022 Faculty of Education Summer Institute. The Faculty of Education Summer Institute, or FESI for short, is one of our faculty's long-standing events bringing together students, communities, school board members, representatives, teachers, educators, youth workers, researchers, community members, ministry representative, and others from across the GTA and elsewhere to pass the top to participate in meaningful conversations that challenge and question some of the current educational, social and schooling issues and problems we're facing in today's educational institutions. Over the years, the conversations have explored how long held educational beliefs, policies and practices have become embedded and normalized in educational institutions and have inhibited the successes we seek in the teaching and learning process. We are particularly concerned in working to address the policies and practices that have negatively affected marginalized students within our educational system. As is the long-term tradition with this conference, FESI 2022 aims to explore the ideas, concerns and practices in education as we seek to reimagine teaching and learning at this time. The theme of this year's Summer Institute is Collective Dreaming, Co-Constructing Conditions for Liberatory Education. This timely and relevant theme provides us with a foundation to have thoughtful discussions and to develop critical understandings of how and what it means to support all students. By contributing to this dialogue, our hope and belief is that collective knowledge and solutions are generated and mobilized, resulting in a plan for action towards significant systemic changes for all students. Here, we in York University, working closely with community partners can help us all maximize our collective impact. Thank you for joining us and please enjoy the next two days of rich conversations and discussions. Bonjour and de vrai magre duck. Nigan way with them to just a cost, now we go shindo dem, even when them all my eye in. Bonjour, everybody. My name is Nigan Sinclair, and I'm very happy to be here uh, speaking at the Faculty of Education Summer Institute uh, Conference on Constructing Conditions for Liberatory Education uh, at York University. So I just want to say a huge miigwech and thanks to everybody for bringing me and for uh, being a part of this. And I especially want to say thanks to the organizers, uh, which was uh, Saima and Sultan. Uh, I just want to say a huge miigwech to, for including me and for doing this work. And, um, you know, I know that you do this a little bit differently, which is that you, uh, you know, post the keynote online. So wherever you are, uh, I know that you're probably watching this from uh, your room or from your uh, house somewhere. Um, so I just want to acknowledge whatever territory that you are on, whatever Indigenous territory that you are a part of. Um, I uh, am a part of Treaty 1 First Nation. So for us, we would acknowledge the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oja Cree, the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota peoples, also relations with the Dene and the Inuit in this territory. And of course, we are at the homeland of the Red River Métis. Uh, and so this is a big, um, beautiful place that I come from. and. Uh, uh, we acknowledge uh, all of the different relationships that we share in this place and we commit to a spirit of reconciliation uh, the best that we can as we are on this learning journey with you um, and with many others uh, who are on this journey. Um, I really appreciate the, uh, the, t the conference theme that you've chosen which is around liberatory education. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in just a minute and I've got some slides and I'm also aware that I should be able to keep in time here so I'm going to go for about 45 minutes and uh, and I hope that this is helpful to you. I'm going to have a bunch of slides so it's not just me talking in front of a camera um, but like I said so I'll tell you a little bit about myself in just a minute here but uh, I really appreciate that this this theme uh, because education at its best form is liberatory. It is something in which we Im inspire critical thinking uh, inclusivity, probably most important of all, is you know empathy 
kindness, generosity, love. And those are the things that I'm going to talk about for today. Uh, liberatory education uh, would be not memorization, but it would be relationship. And uh, this is a really important thing for us to think about because what we're really talking about is Indigenous education. That's what we're really talking about. Because for us as Indigenous peoples, education is not something that we start at 9 a.m. and end at 3.30. Uh, it's not something that we seek a diploma for. Uh, it's not something that we uh, have a set of standards, tests that we write to figure out where are you at in terms of the uh, spectrum or the hierarchy. Uh, indigenous education is about building a relationship with your grandmother. It is about spending time with your grandfather. It is about visiting in and amongst a group of people seeking an answer to a great question. And those great questions are, who are we? Why are we here? Who can help us? And where are we going? Uh, those are the answers that we seek in Indigenous education. As then you notice, all of that is about relationships and so relationships are the liberation and if we are to think of reconciliation reconciliation is inherently about relationships and that brings me to what i'm about to say now so let me pull up my slides here here we are uh, reconciliation is liberation. It is something in which we are going to be talking about for the next little bit. Now, as I told you a little bit about me, um, I'm a person who does a whole bunch of different things in this world. And uh, um, I'll just go back to this picture in just a minute, but I want to just jump to you. This is a little bio. I don't know if uh, if um, you're, there's a bio shared or if you read about this or any way. And I certainly saw that you used an older picture of me. <laughs> I don't quite look like that anymore. Uh, that's me as like a 31 year old, which is like 15 years ago. So I hope that you appreciate it. I look a little bit different now, but, and certainly I have my uh, longer hair now. So, uh, but these are the things that I do. Uh, I'm a lot on media. I'm a professor at the University of Manitoba, the head of the Indigenous Studies Department. Uh, but I do a lot of work these days with CBC. Um, I also write a, a column <coughs> with the Winnipeg Free Press. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, I'm on every Friday with CBC Power and Politics. I'm on, uh, I just guest hosted an episode of The House. Uh, you can catch that. That's on the TRC Calls to Action following the Pope's visit. And, um, yeah, you can just check it out. Uh, there will be some, probably some links shared around and that kind of thing. But, you know, most importantly is I'm an Indigenous person. I'm a brother. I'm an uncle. I'm a, um, a father. But I want to share with you just a few of these pictures right here. This picture right here, and I hope that you can see my, my cursor, but it's the top middle picture right here. This is me at the World Court in The Hague talking to lawyers and judges across the world about implementing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Right beside there, this picture right here, this is a picture of me in downtown Winnipeg talking to people about poverty about uh, the over-incarceration of young Indigenous men in prisons, and then talking to people about the atrocious situation of the child welfare system in Manitoba, where 90% of the, ch the system is Indigenous, and what do we do about that? <clears throat> in one week, I do, did both of those talks. Um, I'm not special in any way. If anything, though, you know, I have uh, a platform and a platform uh, in which I've uh, created and, you know, I share opinions. That's what professors do. But uh, here's what I would say. As an Indigenous person, to operate in the world, you have to be able to do two things at the same time. You have to be able to think macro, big, universal, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, globally then you also have to be able to think about grassroots specific issues. You have to be able to think about poverty and child welfare and justice and health. And you have to think about all of those things at the same time. So you have to know that there's a connection. It isn't unlike back in our ceremonies, we can do two things at the same time. We can think of Gijay Manado, the great mystery, the great essence of creation, the fact that we are a part of creation but we also have to do things today. We have to go hunting and feed ourselves. We have to make a fire. We have to um, bead, bead a wonderful lanyard for our cousins, whatever it might be. We're very specific, the micro and the macro. We need to produce young people, all young people, to think in that direction. Think of the macro, the big, then also think of the micro and be able to work in the micro related to the big. That's the key. That's the key for Indigenous success. 
That's also the key for all young people's success. But I think particularly for young Indigenous peoples, because so much of our educational experience has been about cutting one of the other, and particularly cutting the local, cutting our relationship with our parents, cutting our relationship with our names, cutting our relationship with our very environments, with our geographies. So, so much of our education has been about cutting off the macro and the micro, but particularly the micro. Uh, to make us completely lost out of place, to keep us in a realm in which we are traumatized, to keep us distanced from our parents and, and you know, all keeping that trauma ongoing so that the child welfare system can do its work of removing our children. Um, I tell you this because this is a really important moment for all of us. We are facing a reality in which Indigenous peoples are um, going to continue in the pattern that we have for 150 years, which is throwing Indigenous peoples into poverty, into the jail system, into diabetes, into boil water advisories, into situations. We can continue in that direction, but generally we have an, an uprising, an upswell of resistance within Indigenous communities, or we can face reality, which is how are we going to live together? And how are Indigenous peoples going to be uh, in leadership positions within every segment of society so that Canadians can become competent? Canadians can work effectively with Indigenous nations. The fact is that we uh, have a critical mass right now uh, of Indigenous young people, finally, um, to have gone into, uh, you know, after being kept out of institutions for a very long period of time. We now, this is my graduating class at the very, very long, you know, bottom left-hand corner. Uh, we have now a critical mass of Indigenous peoples who are entering into workforces, entering into places in which you, you're being, you yourself are being witness to. And, and the fastest growing segment of that is in youth. As I'm going to show you in just a minute, Indigenous young people are the fastest growing demographic in Canada. Um, I'm going to show you what they need. Oh, excuse me, just for a second. I jumped one slide ahead there. Um, this is my daughter. Uh, my daughter is in the middle of the picture here. Um, you can see her aunties, her mother, her grandmothers around, surrounding her. Uh, this was her Berry Fast ceremony, uh, which is a special ceremony that we do amongst our people for young women. You'll notice that I am not in this picture because this is a woman's ceremony, uh, but I'm going to show you how I relate in just a minute. Uh, um, this is a ceremony in which a young Indigenous woman gets her first menstruation and she goes on a journey, a journey of learning over the year. She is taught by her aunties and her mother and her grandmother, all the women around her that are important. Uh, and she is taught about her body, who she is. I can't tell you about that ceremony because I didn't do it. I was not one of the primary educators in this, but I did have a role. I'm her father. So I escorted her to all of the different functions and events uh, that uh, particularly she, that she would spend with women, teaching her about who she is, her not just her body, but also about her relationship with space, how to collect medicines. Um, to, to teach about her, her relationship with children, how to have her relationship with creation, um, with uh, future partners, boys or girls, whoever they, those that might be. Um, my daughter is taught, this is an educational journey. And this is an educational journey in which she is uh, taking a significant role by the people around her who have taken it upon themselves to teach her every day for a year, every single day for a year. And at the very end of that year, I, as her father, get to talk and, and teach to her too. And, that, um, and one of the things that she does is why it's called a berry fast ceremony. She gives up berries during that year. And uh, at the end of that year, she is handed a berry by every one of her teachers. Um, now, if any of you have ever done a fast, especially a fast off sugar, you know how sweet that sugar is when you taste it again for the first time. Like, how is it? It's like the most richest, beautifulest taste ever. Because it's like sugar enters into your lips and you're like, mm, this is the greatest thing ever. It's like having a drink of water when you've come in from, uh, you know, being very thirsty for a very long period of time. Um, it, that water is the clearest and tastiest and beautifulest in your mouth. And that's what my daughter is taught about education. At the end of that year, she is taught about sacrifice, about commitment, about the beauty of creation, and that when she tastes education as it happen, as it happens, then it becomes the most beautiful taste that she's ever had in her life. And who gives that to her? Her relatives, the women around her, um, not just her blood relatives, but her kinship, those in her clan, those in her community, those, those women who are around her who are not blood related to her, but are relations to her. <coughs> 
This is a critical pedagogy for understanding Indigenous education and what I will say to be liberation. But you know, this isn't the only thing that we do. It's not the only ceremony we do for education. We do hundreds of others. Uh, this was the Lake Winnipeg water walk that my sisters and my mother did when we were growing up. Um, and uh, not really quite growing up, it was only back in, you know, six, seven years ago. And uh, what my sisters did with my mother is they had a vision and it was a vision of traveling around Lake Winnipeg because Lake Winnipeg was one of the most threatened lakes in North America, full of pollution, algae. Uh, it was at the state of destruction, still is in many ways. And they walked 1400 kilometers in a, in a act of ceremony, carrying a vessel of Lake Winnipeg to show that they were supporting our anti the lake, but then also creating public education, media, trying to spread the word about that. It was a really beautiful and an important moment, but it wasn't just about my sisters and my mother. A little girl came along that journey too. We teach our young people the value of relationships, not just of water, not just of the earth, not just about relationships with your relatives, but that it is that she must do it herself. Notice that she is carrying the vessel of the water because she can be taught, uh, she can be told, she can even write a test. You know, what's the uh, most important element of your life, Sarah? And she would write water and it'd be correct. We could even give her 100%, but she must live it. She must demonstrate it. She must show it because that's what education is all about. Education is not about sitting at a desk and memorizing and listening. It is about action. Education is about action. I don't really care how much time we talk about love. If we don't produce people who demonstrate love, who show it every day, then what's the point? Like what a waste of time. Um, that is what we do in the lodge amongst our people, amongst Anishinaabe people. Um, and notice that now Sarah is doing remarkable things. She's now 16. Here she is on the left-hand side of this picture right here. Um, she got together with her friends and they decided to do something in the spirit of Greta Thunberg, which if you know who that is, um, the young woman in Europe there that is uh, uh, going on climate strikes over s issues of not being taught in school about climate change um, and doing educational demonstrations instead, showing the public that climate change is real, must be dealt with and et cetera. Uh, my daughter and her friends came up with an idea that they wanted to do something similar um, they wanted to demonstrate that to the public and they wanted to invite the public into a gathering which they, they organized themselves for 5,000 people who showed up and uh, these are a bunch of at the time 14 year olds who did this um, just before the pandemic and uh, like what a remarkable thing this is indigenous education in action and the amazing thing is her school supported her to do it in that they gave her time off and they gave her a classroom. They supported uh, people coming in to help them make signs, to help them figure out how to chant properly, to how to write letters to politicians. And this is Indigenous education. This is precisely what it looks like because it is liberatory in such a way that it is Sarah living who she is according to the things that she's learned. Those things are principled in love, bravery, kindness, generosity, wisdom, all those things we call as the seven grandfather teachings or grandparent teachings. And that these teachings are inherently about relationships. The more that we learn about relationships, the more we extract as theory, we'll call that the teachings, the more that we deliver that to our young people, but then we say at the end of teaching them, you must now show this. And whether it be in a very fast ceremony, whether it be in walking with the water, or whether it be just doing an activity like this, which doesn't have to be for 5,000 people. It could be a class presentation. It could be a, uh, you know, a small scale work within your family at the kitchen table. It could be something in which you learn your language, your traditional Anishinaabe, Cree, Oja Cree, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota language. That is how you demonstrate that kindness and generosity, which, by the way, is relational. And as I said before, that is where that is where liberation is found, because it is living the truest sense of yourself. This isn't something new, by the way. This is something that is embedded within Anishinaabe tradition. And even though uh, we may not always see it as such, I want to show you that back in the 19th century, over 200 years ago, in the very territory in which you are sitting right now, <clears throat> in uh, not quite York area, but 
close by in the Mississauga, right? This is a guy called Peter Jones or Kakawakanabe. Kakawakanabe was the very first Ojibwe person to write in English. He was the very first person to publish a book. Uh, he was the very first person to go around, become an Ojibwe Methodist missionary, and then go around and spread the word, and then also fundraise for schools and, and build those relationships for our people. He was alive during a very critical and difficult time in our lives as Anishinaabe. Because in southern Ontario, a genocide took place, a, a, the destruction of our people took place in the early 18th century, just after the War of 1812. Just after the War of 1812, tens of thousands of refugees came back. Some of them from Indigenous nations, but mostly British, British loyalists, came across the border and settled into uh, Upper Canada or Central Ontario. And what they did was, is they stole Indigenous lands. Oftentimes there's these things called land session agreements. They were never really agreements. They were people squatting on Indigenous lands and then the government would come in and pay a few pennies uh, in order to have the settlers uh, have so-called rights from Indigenous peoples in those territories. Uh, and so uh, Peter Jones saw the flooding of Anishinaabe territories, the disease that came with that, with being surrounded by non-Indigenous peoples who were bringing those sicknesses, and then the onset of poverty, which resulted in almost a 90% population loss in our communities in Southern Ontario. You can still see some of those impacts today. Notice that the Anishinaabe communities in and around Toronto, in and around Southern Ontario, uh, they're quite small. Uh, they're quite small because those land session agreements took advantage of a very undermined and, and uh, hurt in Anishinaabe populations, Mississauga populations, pushed them off to the side. So when Peter Jones was writing at this time, he was literally looking at the potential extermination of Anishinaabe. Um, he was thinking at that time that there is a possibility that our people could be extinct. When you lose 90% of your community, and many of those are young people, there is a possibility that you may just fade away as a community. And so everything Peter Jones did was about survival. It was about figuring out like how will Anishinaabe exist into the future. One day uh, upon visiting a school, he witnessed this. Um, he was an educator, but an educator in the way of uh, trying to articulate uh, what it is that what it is that we need to do to survive. Excuse me very much, sorry about that. Oh, oh, oh. Um, and here's what he saw. I was just trying to fix the thing on my screen so that it didn't cover up the text, but um, this, is, this is what he said. It makes the heart of the poor Indian rejoice to see his child read in a book, to see him put the talk to paper and to see the talk go to a distance. That makes him rejoice. Then he writes, I will give you one instance. At the River Credit, we have a station. A chief had a son who was instructed in our mission school after he was employed as a teacher in another school and went away more than a hundred miles from his father. After a time, he wrote a letter to his father in the Indian tongue, which he did not know how to read. The father brought it to me to read for him. And while I read, the tears ran down his eyes and he rejoiced to hear the talk of his son on the paper at a distance. This is the key to this story. There's much you can talk about with this passage. This was a passage written in what we call missionary records, which was Peter Jones writing to other missionaries, making the argument for more schools. He was saying, we want more schools for Anishinaabe students. But notice what he was doing here was very specific. He wasn't talking about residential schools, even though in many ways Peter Jones is credited for uh, coming up with the idea of students should be eating at the schools because in many cases they're starving. Um, and so, <clears throat> Uh, so Peter Jones is credited with kind of, you know, funding schools properly for Anishinaabe people. Um, but this is what he's actually arguing in this piece. He is saying that when we teach Anishinaabe to write in their own language, notice not English, in their own language, that relationships are built. That this is the most Anishinaabe story I can tell you. It's an Anishinaabe person writing about two other Anishinaabe people writing about Anishinaabe one. Like, this isn't writing about the death of our people or the arrival of English and eradicating indigenous languages. This, is, this isn't about residential schools at all. This is about indigenous peoples seeing the power of education to bid to build relationality to the point where this is what makes us rejoice. This is what Peter Jones is saying 200 years ago, and not much has changed. Not much has changed because when we look out into creation, when we look out, 
when we see the birds, when we see the water, we see the trees, it is exactly what we are trying to teach Sarah in that Lake Winnipeg water walk, in that berry fast ceremony, when she's out there talking about the earth in a climate change work. What she's saying is, hey everybody, look out in creation. See how amazing it is. And this is how we do it. That is precisely what we do in the lodge. That's why we sing bear songs. We go, oh, what an amazing creation that has bears within this ecosystem that is related to all these things. We must sing a bear song to honor what we have just witnessed. Action, locality, with big picture, macro, universality. This is the key of understanding where education is finds its biggest legs. Notice that I never said in any way, memorize something, write it on a test, and never think about it again. Which is, by the way, pretty much the majority of your school experience. Write something down, memorize it, write it on the test, never think about it again. <laughs> or think about it peripherally later. Don't Certainly don't live it, right? This is where I think education goes terribly wrong. Now I want to show you what are some instances where this is beginning. Now I come from a removed community. In 1907, my community by gunpoint was removed by the government of Canada, by the town of Selkirk, by the province of Manitoba. We were a community called Peguis First Nation or St. Peter's Indian Reserve. You can see the picture right here. Uh, we were located on the Red River, just south of Lake Winnipeg right there in a place now called Selkirk. Um, there's Selkirk right here. You can sort of see what the original site of our reserve looks like right there. And in 1907, the government of Canada forced us off the land by gunpoint through an illegal removal. Um, this has happened to Indigenous peoples all across the country. Sometimes it's not an illegal remover. Sometimes it's flooding out by hydro. Sometimes it's settlers coming, squatting on your land, and the government comes and pays a few pennies. Canada's project has been and will always be, unless something radically changes, I mean, there is Bill C-15, the United Nations Declaration that the, uh, the, for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, that the government has said that they're going to commit to. I've yet to see any movement on that, but, you know, try to be glass half full. Um, what I would say is that Canada's project has been and continues to be, and will likely be into the future, erasing Indigenous presence from the landscape erasing our pedagogies, our practices, our nations, um, our ways of being from the landscape. The key of understanding that is, is that when we bring it back, when we advocate for it, when we show it, uh, this was an amazing project called the Olga Makana project, which was in downtown Toronto. Um, and this is a project in which you got to see what indigenous presence looks like. What does it look like to have a billboard that was paid for by local activists to say, you must learn this, Toronto. Uh, one of their great slogans, you can probably see this on the left-hand side, is if you want to learn something, first you must learn this. And they're showing the wampum or what the, the treaty called the, the dish with one spoon, which is that all Torontonians must learn that they are a part of a treaty. They are a part of a relationality, a relationship where the law is that we all eat from the same bowl. We can't just simply frack, oil frack till the cows come home. We can't just simply uh, put up a bunch of pipelines everywhere. We can't just simply treat each other like garbage. Leave one group of people with boil water advisories and poverty and over incarceration. We can't just leave them behind because that will harm all of us because we all eat from the same bowl. If we pollute the bowl, we all get polluted, period. I want us to think about what it might look like if we were to do that everywhere, the Oga Makana project, or you know, stop this process of what happened to us at St. Peter's in 1907, my community when we were forcibly removed off the land, what would it look like to truly recognize that we are partners, that we are uh, uh, relatives that share space, that we are legal obligations to one another, and most importantly, we might even call that roommates. What would it look like to recognize that we live together and to, to share 100% of our home with each other, our resources, our food, our money, or I would actually call our wealth, because money is not always wealth. Money, in fact, might be the antithesis of wealth.
Uh, money is about, for instance, individuality. Uh, it is not about collectivity. Uh, money is about, this is my money. I individually own this. Uh, but it is love that is really the currency of community. Kind kindness, generosity. Uh, that is where true wealth is. Do you have love? Because you can have all the money in the world, but you cannot buy love. Uh, this is what indigenous territories would begin to look like. Now, two things I want to point out, this wonderful uh, website right here called nativeland.ca. Um, first is, notice that indigenous territories are inherently overlapping. Uh, all you do is you click on territories, it'll show you every indigenous territory in North America um, or Turtle Island. What do you notice? You notice that all the indigenous territories overlap like this. Second, you notice that that doesn't compromise their integrity or their autonomy, or we'll call their sovereignty. Notice that two indigenous nations can inherit the same space, and it doesn't erase Cree people, it doesn't erase Anishinaabe, in fact, it makes them stronger. It makes them more reliant on each other. And the most important of all, seems to be that when you follow love, kindness, generosity, and people live together and accept each other on, on their own terms, then people all benefit. Love begats more love. Kindness begats more kindness. Inclusion promotes more and more inclusion. Like, that's the thing that I think is the most interesting of all, which is, it's as simple as that when we want to talk about liberation. Or if we want to talk about Indigenous education. You know, I could talk about Indigenous education all day, but um, I'm already over time here uh, in this where I want it to be at this point, but I'll, I'll just keep going. Um, because what I'll say is that, you know, when we get to what school systems should be doing, what you're going to realize is that it's in everything in this slide. It is about saying, okay, let's look to see what Indigenous peoples have done and have been doing for tens of thousands of years on these territories. And what have they been doing? Creating locality by thinking universally, by you know, building that lodge, um, hunting, fishing appropriately in spaces in which you keep sustainability at the heart of your work. There's that kindness and generosity again. Um, and that you think to yourself, okay, how am I going to create this local life, demonstrate it, but learn the principles of the universality, or we'll call that natural law. I noticed that when the eagles fly are the ways they raise their young, or I noticed that when the deers come and go and they teach certain things that show us about... Uh, um, space or about medicines or bears when they wake up and they show us about the the essence of being in a reciprocal and symbiotic relationship with the earth that's why bears can hibernate by the way um, they can hibernate because they have such a close relationship with the earth they know precisely what medicine to take they know precisely what time to wake up and they know precisely where is the space that's going to be the most safest the, the place in which they're going to be able to um, create and build a relationship and that's why they're so caring about their space or why they're so protective of that space too they don't let invaders or people who disrespect come in that's why bears mark trees for example right all of these things is what we might call science or biology or or um, physical education but really i'm just talking about indigenous education you know because we don't have departments we don't go okay hey everybody it's now science time what we say is okay guys it's time to go to the lodge and at the lodge we're going to learn about it all we're going to learn science math phys ed health literature uh, social studies right uh, we're going to learn it all and uh, there's some really wonderful um, principles uh, that you can learn and extract from these uh, people who have worked in that direction those are from the canadian council of learning i showed you, showed you first nations uh, um, a, uh, an Inuit on the le on the right there, and at the bottom is a Métis learning uh, learning pedagogical chart. But what you can see right here, this is a First Nations one right here. Um, notice how there are two elements. There's the roots, and then there's the branches. If you do not have strong roots, you cannot learn at your fullest form in the branches. Here's what I mean. Uh, if an Indigenous student is coming to us and they don't know their language, they don't know the natural world, they don't know who their family is, they don't know their clan, they don't know uh, who their nation is or what their nation did or, or who their heroes are in their nations, then they are hampered always and continually from becoming their fullest spiritual, cultural, social, economical and political selves. They'll always be looking for those roots because those roots are not there and therefore it's like a tree that tries to stand up it'll always fall over 
If a, a tree with no roots will always fall over. And so <clears throat> the key to understanding this is Indigenous students are not coming to us always with those things because of colonialism, the impact of residential schools, the fact that we still don't recognize Indigenous languages as official anywhere in the country other than Nunavut. By the way, Indigenous-led government, um, surprise, surprise, they, they are looking out for um, the betterment of everyone because uh, not just Indigenous peoples, but non-Indigenous peoples, because we must, Nunavut is the only place, Northwest Territories, Nunavut, are the only places where we say Indigenous peoples matter, and they matter in law. So they certainly don't matter for the federal government, they certainly don't matter for provincial governments, in that they don't get laws that are specifically addressed to protect language and culture, just like English and French do. Uh, they don't get um, recognition of their territorial claims. Why do I know that? Because we're endlessly marching to the Supreme Court. And when's the last time you ever saw an Indigenous person in any Canadian government represent Indigenous peoples? They don't. They represent Canadians. We see Indigenous peoples in there occasionally, and they represent Canadians. They don't represent Indigenous peoples. Maybe recognize, rep, rep, represent you know, a handful of them, but they don't represent Indigenous nations on our own terms. So that means we still have a world in which we're being erased from the map. The government does it. Uh, textbooks do it. And yes, you also participate in that. I'm going to show you how in just a minute. But... Everyday Canadians also are lacking roots as well. Um, for instance, the, the, the biggest root that, that Canadians are lacking is they do not understand that they have an innate relationship with Indigenous peoples. It is essential. It is foundational. It is fundamental. Everything that we call as Canadian is invented by Indigenous peoples. Democracy, healthcare, social welfare system, Every single penny of the Canadian economy is because of Indigenous lands and resources. Every single law and policy, like democracy, or like the uh, very system that we work upon, the fact that we have names of towns, names of rivers, all the knowledge that's led us to this moment based in treaty. Every Canadian has a foundational relationship with Indigenous peoples. That means that if we were to do this for Canadians, the number one route would be relationships with Indigenous peoples. I'm going to guarantee that that is not something we teach regularly in schools. Maybe a little bit more so now, but certainly not when I was growing up. And that means that those who are in charge, those who are my age and above, those who are in charge of businesses, government, schools, are some of the least capable people, meaning we haven't been trained properly, uh, to be able to uh, bring this message and change the dialogue. Now, maybe the next... If we're brave, if we have courage, maybe the next generation might be able to rectify that. And that's really the question. That's what I'm calling on you to do today by thinking about Indigenous education. Uh, what I want to do is I want to show you that there is a fundamental problem happening amongst Indigenous learners. But I want to talk about really all learners as a sort of a liberatory model. Uh, we can talk about Indigenous competency or Indigenous success rates all we want. But what I really want to talk about is how do we get to success? How do we produce a system in schools that ensure success? Well, I'm going to argue that there is a basic formula that we use, and I'm going to show you how that leaves Indigenous students behind, but it also leaves Canadian students behind in that we don't teach them how to work effectively with Indigenous peoples. And that, that magic formula that you're seeing right here um, is lacking. It is lacking many different parts, four in particular, and that if we insert those four in, we will get to a system of liberation. Now, every school has a basic formula. It is the, there is potential in all students. Every situation, every textbook, every instance, every person at a time walks in your room, there is potential for something. So we, uh, we build schools on the notion that everyone has potential. Uh, it wasn't always that way, but recently we have. We say, every student has potential, boom. We offer opportunity as educators, as teachers, as administrators. So that means that we take students plus us. So that's opportunity. That's textbook. That's what we have to share. That's the information. You know, all those things that we're trained in faculty to do as educators. And then what we do is we divide that by relevance. And here's where the trick begins to happen. We think that relevance is a very specific thing. I want you to think of what is the most relevant thing for teaching young people. 
And this is where I get someone probably who out there who's saying, uh, to make them good people. No, we don't do that at all. <laughs> we never ask young people to be good people. Unless they're in the younger grades. We do that really well, actually. In kindergarten, grade one, grade two, grade three, we actually have things on the on the report card. Sharing, kindness, generosity. We grade students, actually, on are you a good person in kindergarten to grade, say, grade four, grade five, grade six. And then suddenly, boom, junior high hits, or when the credits start to really matter. And then we forget all the stuff about being good people. We leave all that behind. And we say, have you memorized the number of residential schools there is in the country? Have you uh, been able to do this math problem, which is completely unrealistic and has nothing to do with real life? Um, have you uh, been able to demonstrate your capability to throw a ball in this way? Like, so what we've said is, is that we've decided that relevancy doesn't have to do with kindness, generosity, love. It's now about competition. It's about individuality. It's about capitalism, really. It's about going, okay, can you learn this so that you can compete? You can end first or get a number by your name. This is very important for you to understand because this is actually why Indigenous students are left behind. Because we don't seek those values. Our, our, less, our least community values are individualism, capitalism, and competition. In fact, everything antithetical to Indigenous traditions is those things. Uh, we want people to be committed to community, to shovel the snow for our elders, to uh, you know cook the food, to deliver the food to, to uh, people who are in leadership positions. Um, we want at the feast everybody to eat, not some people to be left behind. We don't want capitalism, even though I know that it's a world that's real and we need to figure out a way to have a relationship with capitalism. But capitalism is about going, who can profit the most and accumulate the most wealth? We have this little thing in our community called share the moose. If you bag a moose and you cut up the moose, you have to share it with everybody. We might even call that socialism if we really think about it, but it, you know, whether I'm not here to debate the political terms. But what I am here to say is that if we're to determine success, it seems to be a break here. It seems to be a very significant thing that we are lacking. What we are lacking in school systems is that there is no indigenous relevance. And there is relevance perhaps in the kindergarten level, but not once the credits matter. We leave sharing, kindness, generosity completely off the tests, completely off the grading system. In fact, what we do is we encourage students to compete, treat each other terribly, and then most importantly is leave everybody else behind while you go and have success uh, doing in the stock market on Bay Street. And we think that's success. Newsflash, it's not success for Indigenous peoples. When they go home, they're going to realize that the school system is completely antithetical, quite colonial, um, in its very makeup. And we're also going to realize that Canadian students are being taught to steal, to be mean, and then most importantly to be an individual far before you want to be a community member. And I just explained exactly boil water advisories, over incarceration of young Indigenous youth, uh, poverty. I've explained it all because we condition young people in schools to not be liberatory, to be quite oppressive. Now, I want us to look at schools for just a minute here in the last few minutes I have. I want you to look to see, this is the way a school breaks down. These are all the elements that go within a school. Um, notice that the curriculum is only one of that 11. What do students learn in a school? Newsflash, not textbooks. They learn a little bit about textbooks. They learn a little bit about uh, you know, the War of 1812, or they learn a little bit about, I don't know, they learn a little bit about Romeo and Juliet. But I guarantee to you this, if you turn to a student uh, in grade 12, let's say, or grade 9 or something like that, and you said, what was the most remarkable point of your school experience? What are you going to remember for years to come? I'm guaranteeing none of them will say algebra. They will say, my friends, if you're lucky, a teacher. 
we teach relationships in schools. We don't teach curriculum. Or relationships are really the curriculum because look at the way a school actually operates. We teach far more in counseling, school policy, school attitudes, like who your school holds up as a mascot is more powerful than anything you ever teach in a classroom. How do I know that? How many people choose to come in a classroom? How many people choose to go to the football game? Or choose to go to play in sports? Choose to go and, uh, like if they have a choice, where are they gonna go? They're gonna choose the place in which relationality is open and they're not getting those relationships as much when they are sitting there in the classroom in rows, uh, reading from a play written 600 years ago or 700 years ago. Like, I'm not blaming that play or I'm not blaming the math or I'm not, I'm just saying it is not pertinent. It doesn't have relationality at its core. It's quite opposite, it's very capitalistic, is to say, well, just memorize this and then just worry about everything else later like don't worry about living it because it's unrealistic that's the thing whenever i did physics by the way it was always the weirdest experience because they're like don't worry about gravity and i was like like how do you do anything without gravity <laughs> it seems now i get that it's for efficiency but at some point we should go okay well you know now with gravity <laughs> or let's all try this and um how is this going to impact our lives get away from capitalism and say it's more about sharing how do we share um my point of saying all of this is is that schools are real social systems and that the, when we realize that schools are these systems of social engagement and social practice then what we realize is that there is an opportunity here to begin to think of what would be successful initiatives that we could bring indigenous and non-indigenous students together and that's really what I wanted to think about, because if we look to Indigenous educational practices, they're always about relationship building. And so if uh, I've had an opportunity to travel around the country and to see all of these different initiatives, to see the ways in which they go and they shake out and they, they build relationships. And so the key here is understanding is going, OK, well, it's about mentorship. It's about including students in government, in leadership positions. It's about hiring Indigenous peoples and making them present in a space, saying Indigenous voices matter here. It's about including LGBTQ perspectives, but Indigenous ones of those as well. It's about saying that you know traditional knowledge has a value here. Because you know what traditional knowledge will do? Traditional knowledge will force you to go on the land, which is action. It's not about sitting in a classroom, it's about going, how do we live this teaching of math that we just did? How do we, uh, you know, if we say to ourselves, okay, we're gonna do beadwork in the math classroom. We're gonna realize that beadwork is all about basically exponents. It's going, okay, this is, this is times this equals this, or this beads equals this for this pattern, for this picture. Um, the star blankets are similar. Uh, thinking about the ways in which indigenous science is the only science that belongs to this place, was invented in this place. Um, or the fact that, you know, when we, we obsess about putting indigenous content in English and social studies, but those are the most problematic places. Because if we put them in English, we'll put them in a, in, uh, a place in which we're only focusing on trauma. That's what we always focus on conflict in literature. Or if we put them in social studies, we always frame indigenous peoples as some sort of problem for the state to solve. So I don't actually care anymore about social studies and English language arts. Those are good places. And, but the real place in which the magic occurs, in which you're gonna see uh, relationality leading to liberation, it's math classrooms, science classrooms, it's physical education, health. It's all those classrooms that we most often think of as not having indigenous pedagogy but that's what indigenous pedagogy is all about like we had to learn the world before we could teach it or write about it like it's amazing to me how if we, we think oh if we just drop that novel in no if we drop indigenous science in we'll actually learn what indigenous peoples are doing and the novel will actually help that because the novel will show it in practice and we go oh okay now we can embody it but it's like we're starting at the novel and we never do who the people are we just talk about what they aren't because we always focus on conflict when it comes to the novel social studies same thing and so my point is here is to try to give you a method to think about this as a liberatory practice and uh, what i've been able to do is extract out of these 
what I think are the most important elements, the four things that I think embody themselves within those practices. Um, so the first is that relationships are at the core. We talked about that. Second is we insert indigenous relevance, which is about community, not capitalism, not just capitalism. It's not that we leave capitalism behind because we know that indigenous peoples have to live in a realistic world. So we say, how can we take indigenous relevancy and Canadian relevancy and bring them together? And then we say, okay, well, we've got to make sure that everybody in the system is on board, teachers, administrators, parents, students. That means everyone's got to have respect for what we're trying to do here. Lastly, we got to take responsibility. And what we realize something, which is that when success comes, success is not an end point, but a beginning point. So when we get success, we go, okay, how can we reproduce that success? How can we make more students that are going to come back and help the system? Because you've got to embody the things that you are being taught. And there's no better way to show generosity than to show generosity back to the very program that produced you. And this, my friends, is the magical formula. This is the formula for Indigenous student success. This is the formula for Canadian student success. This is the formula for, re for, for revolution, frankly, but it's also the formula for liberation. You want to see liberatory education? This is it. First thing we do is we take respect. We say we give proper training to all the teachers, administrators, do exactly what you're doing right now in university. We fulfill the call to action uh, from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to say that we should all be competent on Indigenous education. And then what we do is we use the same formula as before, potential plus opportunity. There's the students, there's we are. And then we say, okay, let's put Indigenous relevancy in there. It's not just about capitalism, competition, and then profit. It's about going, okay, how do we share the moose? How do we uh, embody ourselves in a relationship of love and kindness, building better people? By the way, it's another call to action, call to action 63. It's about producing empathy, right? Amongst uh, the understanding what residential schools were, but then most importantly, how they created legacies throughout society. And then we say, okay, every time we do that, every teacher that does that, every administrator that does that, they show respect, they understand the formula, they're exponentially producing that success, and then boom, we've got success, maybe that's a diploma, but then we realize that diplomas aren't really what students are seeking. What they're seeking is to be better people. Hopefully, we've conditioned them to understand that they can understand the macro, extract from the macro, and then work locally activate themselves locally to be able to create a better environment. Oh, by the way, this is indigenous educational practice, has been here for 10,000 years. And the number one rule is, is that indigenous young people, when they, when they learn something, now they must do it. They must give back to the community. We've never, not once ever, trained somebody on a drum, trained someone how to make a fire, trained somebody how to raise children and said, oh, well, just forget that business. No, now you've got to go and help your community, build the fire, sing the song, help other people parent now. Like when, I'm, when I do uh, um, Indigenous graduations, I always say at the finish of my speeches, I say, now that you have achieved, you must help others achieve. That is what it means to be Anishinaabe. That is what it means to be Indigenous. And I'm saying to you now, as education students, as students who are embedded within liberation. Now that you have understood reconciliation, your job is to share it. Your job is to go and evoke it. Your job is to achieve it within your locality and then continue to achieve it. Continue to enact it. Because it is not about going, well, I'm done now. I got my diploma. It's about going, I got my certificate, I got my diploma, I got my, I got my point in which I've now learned this, I must now enact it, I must help everybody around. I, work, I do workshops with reconciliation all the time and that's the thing that I do at the, the very end, is I say now you must publish your findings. You must share that amongst your other educators. You must share that best practice so that all of your practice increases and improves. So let's do that together. And here's four questions that I would like you to try. I would like you to think this out silently wherever you are at the moment. If you're with a partner, you can try this together. Uh, you can pause the video right now and you can try to go these four questions. Uh, but here are methods that you can lead yourself to uh, in your teaching practice and pedagogy. Most of you are within schools or certainly headed to within schools. You may think about your own school experience as well. I just want you to think about what successes have Indigenous students experienced and what are two or three things that we can see happening 
And then how do you notice that non-Indigenous students would benefit from those things? And then most importantly is what you realize is that these are indicators of liberation. They're indicators of reconciliation happening because what you're doing is you're producing love, kindness, generosity, wisdom, and you're producing it locality so that it can be evoked universally. So that that person goes and yes, if they're even a stockbroker, yes, if they're even a CEO, maybe they become a teacher, maybe they become an author, that they can then influence universally what they have learned locally that within those pedagogies, those principles of relationality, it is about critical thinking, it's about love, about generosity, it's about creating that as a micro for a society that desperately, desperately needs a macro. That is what we're trying to do and achieve within reconciliation, but I think we're also just trying to achieve that as educators. This is my email right here. Uh, I'm going to stop share that right there. I'm going to say a big miigwech to all of you for listening to me and giving me this time and this space. I did pretty good. I'm a few minutes over, but I hope that you uh, don't mind it. I hope that you appreciated that I got a very, you know, very small chance to be a part of this uh, wonderful conference in which you are a part of. And, and I can't say thanks enough for inviting me virtually, as it were, to York uh, to be able to be a part of the uh, Faculty of Education Summer Institute. Um, and, uh, you know, big miigwech to all of you. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your conference and time together. I know there is some in-person portions. I wish I could be there. I hope that I, uh, at some point, am able to be there in the future to see you and shake your hands and say miigwech and share some food with you. Uh, but until such time, I, uh, I send you nothing but the best in my love and my thoughts as you do this work together. So uh, miigwech, uh, gigawamin minwa was what we would say. We would say see you soon when we come together and uh, kanigana. Uh, in Didway Maganaduk. Thanks very much, everybody.